Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode 111. 111. Sound, uh, sounds significant for some reason. Probably because this guest is significant in the overall journey uh, of this show. A bunch of years ago, there were uh, there were two names that I was like, oh man, if I could if I could get them on, like they were my dream guest, you know. Um, and it finally happened. This episode is a personal hero of mine, Ahmed Best, and Ahmed is even cooler than I thought he would be. Ahmed, you would know from uh, the Star Wars prequels, most likely he played Jar Jar Binks. He was the voice. He did the motion capture and. Uh, He's done a lot of really cool stuff, and he's a really, really cool, multifaceted artist. He's a super creative person, and we talked about a ton of stuff. We talked about doing cool things with his son, showing him where opportunities are in the things that he enjoys. We talk about how Ahmed growing up in the Bronx fueled his creativity, being around so many different things. Uh, we talk about following through with ideas, different things that he learned from George Lucas as far as the creative process goes. We talked about meeting his wife doing the Broadway show Stomp, and while touring with Stomp, he was scouted by the casting director for the prequels and was cast as Jar Jar. Uh, we talk about what that was like. We talk about working with ILM on the motion capture technology, which at the time didn't really exist. They kind of created it as it went on, and Smeagol later on, and Avatar, all the things that we enjoy now in the motion capture world is because of the work that these guys did for episode one. It's amazing, amazing behind-the-scenes stories. Uh, I had to ask him about Liam Neeson. I had to, and I did it, and I was not disappointed. It was super cool hearing stories about that. We talked about how much we both love Rob Coleman. Some great behind-the-scenes stories about uh, Ahmed helping out with the Yoda fight in episode two. We talk about uh, choosing the voice for Jar Jar Binks, what that was like, the different iterations, why he chose that specific one. Uh, we talk about our mutual love of anime, and then we, uh, we dove into what it was like to return to Celebration after a 20-year hiatus and what that was like, uh, go walking out into an arena to people chanting his name, which in my opinion is way overdue. Uh, we also end on a, on a little note talking about his one-man show. He's got a one-man show coming out later this year where he tells the story of his life. It's going to be really, really great. Keep a lookout for that. Um, we didn't have a lot of time, but please check out his podcast called the Afrofuturist Podcast. It's so good. This may be the interesting podcast, but his show is the most interesting podcast. It's great. It's all about Afrofuturism. Ahmed is a great host. Cannot recommend it enough. Check that out at theafrofuturistpodcast.com. But let's get into this. I can't believe this happened, guys. Please enjoy the interesting podcast, episode number 111, with Ahmed Best. Theme song time. <laughs> I saw you went to Capitol Records yesterday. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went with my son. Um, a friend of mine who I went to high school with now works there. And I've always wanted to have a tour of Capitol Records because, you know, I grew up a musician. And yeah. It was one of those things, you know, the house that Nat King Cole built. And, yeah. you know, just this wonderful place of history. And all these years I've been in L.A., I've never been there. I passed by it like a million times. So Sure. Um, one of my friends from high school worked there and my son's home from school. So I was like, Hey man, can we get a tour? And he hooked up a tour for us and it was mind blowing. Dude. I loved it. I yeah. bet. I bet. I you held Sinatra's microphone. Do you, do you feel different? Did it change you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm a much better singer now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you haven't washed the hand, right? Obviously. No, no, okay. no, definitely not. Good, and, you good. know, even though it wasn't plugged in, still counts. The spirit of Sinatra just came over me. And now I'll be um, probably uh, a Vegas lounge act that's going to be extremely popular. Oh, yeah, of course. Of course. That's that's part of it. It's like once you touch the Holy Grail, there's that's the natural progression. Yeah, of course. Exactly. I get it. I get it. And Play it was... Nat King Cole's piano. 
Oh, Touch you Frank did? Sinatra's microphone. <gasps> yeah, I played. Dude. Yeah, you, you've literally, like, brushed fast. greatness. Yeah, it was quite wonderful. Quite wonderful. It's also genius that I saw, I saw in your stories that your son did it as well. Smart. You just you just solidified yeah, your bloodline people. as great, you know? Straight up, you know, a lot of times I am working and he is at school and you know, this this life that I lead is is, is very volatile, you know. You never know where you're going to be at one time. And That's true. Unfortunately, because I work so sporadically, I don't have anything. I don't have like a 9 to 5 like regular people. Right. I have to find those times to kind of make our days together, you know, not just every regular day, just cut something kind of special. And now that he's home from school and, and, and I didn't want him on, you know, Jedi Fallen Order all day. Right. <laughs> I was just like, we got to go outside and go see some stuff. So I'm calling in some favors and trying to keep it creative. And, you know, the best thing I ever did was become a father and, I really dig it. I really love being a father, and I, and, I, and I love my son so much. And I want him to be exposed to all of this stuff. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want him to see all the possibilities that he can make of himself. And, you know, Capitol Records is the house that Nat King Cole built. Yeah. And at that time, you know, when it was segregation and there was – just out and out blatant racism and Nat King Cole was the highest selling artist on Capitol Records. Yeah. And for a dark skin black man playing jazz music to build such a strong foundation, a legacy for millions of artists literally since him to come through was important for my son to see. You know, totally. he can see that and know that what is possible. You know, if you have the talent, if you have the focus, if you have the drive, if you have the help, you know what I'm saying? Like, all of this is possible. So I really wanted him to check that out. And he loved it. I bet. I love that. I love that story. I mean, that's why representation matters, because sometimes you got to see it to believe it. You know, so I love you see that uh, in Atlanta, Tyler Perry just made like a massive studio on land that used to be owned by the Confederacy. And now he's making movies and building yeah. opportunities. I'm like, yes, that's what I'm talking about. It's so cool. Absolutely. And, you know, all you need is the idea. That's the most powerful thing on this planet is an idea. Agreed. And once you have the idea and you start to move towards the idea, then all the rest of the stuff just comes. You know, just putting it out there is, is, is a big deal. A lot of people have an idea and they'll just like shrug their shoulders and be like, oh, well, I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do this. Right. And I, I, I was never one to do that. I, if I had an idea, I tried to execute it as much as possible on whichever level I could. Right. So I even if it's like, what do I have in my pocket? Can I make this idea work with just what I have? You know, and then I do it. And then, you know, can I make this idea work with people that I want to work with? Do that. Can I make this idea work on a small scale, medium scale, large scale? And every idea that I have starts like that. Can I do it? What's in my pocket? Can I do it? You know, with people who I want to be around? Can I do it small scale, medium scale, large scale? And you know, most of the ideas that I have come to fruition because of that. Right. You know. And when I'm talking to my son and I'm talking to his friends, you know, if they're playing a video game. I'll take them to a company that makes video games. Oh, so cool. it's just like, you don't just play this game. Right. You could actually write this game and create this game and put this game out. You don't have to just be the user of this game. You can be the conceptualizer and other people can play your games. That's why I'm not the, you know, one of these dads who's just like, no video games, no TV, no, right. no social media, stuff like that. Like Everything in moderation, of course, mm -hmm. but there's an immense amount of creativity that comes on all of these platforms. Oh, yeah. And I think what happens is a lot, of the, a lot of these young people, they're passively watching other people make stuff. And I'm just like, look, yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> cool. You can watch other people make stuff. But here is also the path for you to have your voice and make the stuff that you want to make. Yeah. You don't just have to be passive, you know? So seeing it and having it being tangible, having it being this thing that you want to 
you know, you can make and having it not be this pie in the sky dream. If only you had that, 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 that's important to me. Yeah. That, you know, that's very, very beautiful. Important. It's a great way to look at things as well. Cause you're like, here's a thing that you enjoy, but you're like pulling back the curtain and being like, and here are opportunities that you can make happen. It's like, you're, you're seeing past the, yeah. the top layers of things. It's smart. Yeah. Yeah. That's the point. That's the point. I like it. I like it. Was it so? Was that mm-hmm. having an idea and bringing it to fruition? I mean, especially in LA. I mean, it's a city of ideas and the world. Really, was that something that like you learned to do, or were you always kind of wired that way? I was always wired that way. But yeah. what I did learn how to do was make it possible on separate different um, layers, several different foundations. And I really got to thank you know George Lucas for this because. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I spent I just spent a lot of time with him during the prequels and, you know, really got to talk to him and got to know him. And, and he's very much an idea person, mm-hmm. but he also has the courage to, you know, regardless of opinions inside or outside, he has the courage to, like, bring his ideas to fruition. Love it. And watching his process was incredibly educational because I watched it go from can we do this thing? And him getting other people excited about doing this thing and just getting those juices flowing, those creative juices flowing until you have a thing and, and you can see it and you can conceptualize it and you can talk about it and you can collaborate on it. And I just really love being in that environment with that energy. And I really wanted to keep my life in that environment and that energy. So when I started making my own stuff and started writing and directing and producing, my goal was, you know, I just want to laugh every day. Yeah. I want to have fun every day. Same. I want to be around people I really like. And um, I want to make stuff with people who not only challenge me, but see it the same way I do. Like, it's not just work, but it's fun. And we enjoy our work and we enjoy being around each other and we, I'd be together we all enjoy challenging each other and you know the very tired cliche of it's about the journey is so fucking true yeah <laughs> <laughs> and as much as, as much as it feels like you know, kind of like self-help self-help industry thing to say uh-huh if you enjoy the journey you'll keep making you'll keep making things, you know, which is how I like to oversimplify it. You know, if sure. the journey is arduous, you're not going to do it. That's true. You know, but that's true. If the journey is fun. If people on the journey who are having fun with you, then you'll make great stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think they all realize that. And that's why they are who they are. I think you're right. And the best thing is always when you have a good idea and then people that are also into it, it becomes it becomes more fun, and when everyone's having a good time, the product is just better. It's like chefs that like food. The love of the collaboration, the love of the camaraderie, and, you know, every once in a while, you you strike a chord with society at large. Every once in a while, the zeitgeist of culture lines up with your idea. Sometimes it doesn't, but with the with the process of it, with the fact that you're not doing it alone, it makes the ebbs and flows of whatever's going on culturally a little bit more easier to deal with, a little bit more palatable. You know what I'm saying? Because you're like, okay, we tried that. Totally. Let's try something else. Right. That didn't work. Let's pivot to learn from what worked and then pivot to the thing that is next. You know, so as long as you had a group of people around you who are excited, energetic to learn, then you're always going to be playing with house money. It's always going to be fun. It's always going to be great. I agree. I agree. It's also interesting that, like, I guess learning on set from George Lucas, it's like you got film school, but you also got, like, like film school is very technical, you know, where you learn the craft and, like, how to do things on the textbook level. But then learning from him, you got this, like, other, like, jet fuel of inspiration side to it. Yeah. It was really exciting. He was he he was just really great on day to day management. You know, coming seeing the problems that would arise and pivoting towards real time solutions. And we had like a couple of catastrophic days that would have shut other productions down. I bet. But he always looked at what could be done, 
with what you have at that moment. He was never just, he never shrugged his shoulders and was like, well, nope, not today. Let's just eat, you know, this million dollars. And, right, you, know, yeah. and <laughs> you know, it was really, um, he was really engaged and he really found real world solutions to real world problems at the time. And, you know, the prequels were independent movies. He financed them. He didn't have studios financing them. So, I love it. you know, it was his dollar. It was his, it was his risk, you know what I'm saying? Like, and yeah. he banked on himself. He believed in himself. It was powerful. George Lucas, in my opinion, is like one of the greatest artists of our time because he made his yeah. art regardless of outside opinion. He was like, the fact that we all love Star Wars is inconsequential because he made his thing and we just happened to like it. But he was still making his thing. And I think that's so cool. Like, especially in a commercial market, to do something like that, to bank on yourself and be like, this is my art, whether you like it or not. It's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, he kind of created that market. There really was nothing like it in the 70s. Right. To compare it to. True. The market exists because he made it. You know, licensing was never a thing until he made it a thing. You know? True. And arguably... You know, trilogies on screen never were really a thing until he made it a thing. Not in like the blockbuster summer movie kind of way. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like there were blockbusters before, you know, this was a summer blockbuster, but there was there was never really this kind of continuation of a story on film. It ha- it hadn't worked until he did it. Really. Sure. So this whole market that we're in is because he took this risk and he took a chance. And, you know, the reason why studios hold off on licensing now is because George made so much off of it and they didn't see it coming. Like, he right. hit him, <laughs> he hit him in, in there. They weren't looking, That's right. you know. And now, you know, most of revenue is drawn, you know, from marketing and licensing. It's just as important as making the film. So he really created you know, what we are in now, honestly, what we're kind of suffering from, Yeah, <laughs> you know, because studios, the studios <laughs> got so huge because they made so much money and now they have to sustain that. And, and it's difficult to sustain that if you're not coming from a, a storytelling background, you know, right. if you're just thinking about the marketing and licensing first, you're going to build your story around how much licensing and marketing you can sell. And that has not proven to work yet. True, true. It's all It up. might. But you it never might, know. You know what I'm saying? Like in the future, it might. You don't know. But so far, going the other way doesn't really work. Yeah, yeah. You know. So I know you're from the Bronx, but I don't know what oh. that, what what was that like? What is a childhood in the Bronx around the time that you grew up? What does that look like? Um, it looks like not a lot of money, but a lot of spirit. It's just a, it was a I understand culturally culturally rich neighborhood, you know, at the time, and it was the birth of hip hop. It was the birth of break dancing. It was the birth of yeah. New York City street culture really making a mark and permeating through the entire world. And a lot of people from my neighborhood went on to do really great things because of that background. Like J-Lo was from my neighborhood. And, oh, right. Um, Alert was from my neighborhood. Cool Herc was from down the road. Dude. Uh, Karis, Boogie Down Productions, they were from up the street. Like, you know, where I was growing up in the South Bronx was really like a hotbed for an amazing amount of creativity. It was a lot of creative people there. Music in the streets. It went from like jazz to salsa to um, to hip hop to R and B. There used to be these huge parties across the street from my building where Grandmaster Flash used to grab his mom's turntables what? and DJ. That's that's where DJing the way. Um, Hip hop is DJ now. That was where it started. That was the birthplace of it. You know, and they used to yeah. jack into the street lights for power. They would play these <laughs> all night long and drive my parents crazy. But we <laughs> loved it, you know? Yeah. We were kids. We loved it. And summertime was just parties until the break of dawn. And it was it was great. And my father would be 
upset because he had to go to work <laughs> in the morning about music all day and all night. But, you know, that's where hip hop was born. And it was just an amazing time to be in New York City at. And, and, you know, cardboard boxes and break dancing and all of that stuff. So it was very, even though it wasn't, we didn't have a lot of money and, and, you know, New York at the time, there was like blackouts and water shortage and gas yeah. shortage and all of this. There's an amazing amount of art in the city, you know? Sure. And this is like Andy Warhol's kind of reign at the factory and, Jean-Michel Basquiat on the street, just tagging buildings. And you would see the stuff, Keith Haring and all of this, all of this work going on, you know, which was street art and street work. Mm -hmm. Warhol brought it in and kind of fitted it all. But, you know, we saw it on the streets, Man. you know, and it was, it was really uh, life altering, life changing. I bet. It's hard not to be inspired when you're surrounded by that much life. Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't, it was. It, it wasn't legal. Yeah, you know of course. Like, Who you know, needs that? <laughs> also, saw, saw the power of art. We saw the power of it because hip hop was extremely political. Right. And as we were, we were listening to these rhymes and writing rhymes, we noticed that we were trying to be shut down by establishment. Right. And so young people were just like, oh snap, we got a voice. And they're hearing our voice and they're trying to shut us down. We couldn't get into art galleries with graffiti. So there was graffiti on the trains and graffiti on the walls. There and, you go. You know, people had to be, they had to express themselves. And, you know, you would tag something and you'd see a train go by and you'd know who the tag was. And then the next thing you know, they get arrested. Yeah. They get in jail. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And we're just like, man, to us, art had power. Right. You know, to us, art had um, influence and a voice. And then, you know, what happened was the establishment took it off the trains and put it in galleries and, you know, made it more difficult for street artists to express themselves. They changed the laws. They made it extremely exclusive. And then only certain people could make this work. Sure. So then we also saw that, you know, we also saw the gentrification of the, of the culture in the South Bronx, you know? Yeah. We also saw um, the, the degrading of lyrics and hip hop in the way where there's now only kind of one thing. Hip hop was just multifaceted at the time. You know, you had conscious rappers talking about politics. You had rappers talking about education, you had rappers talking about black history. And then you also had the gangster rap and you had the cats talking about drugs and selling drugs. Right. The street life. But and decided that hip hop should have lane and that lane ended up being the gangster lane. You know, it ended up being the street life lane. So it became increasingly difficult for lyricists to write rhymes that didn't have to do with street life. And a lot of people who were writing rhymes didn't come from that. You know what I mean? Like most deaf Talib Kweli, they had a bookstore in Brooklyn. They were very educated in Talib Kweli's rhymes that were incredibly educated and, you know, almost prose. Sure. You know, he worked at a bookstore with my sister. You know what I'm saying? Like there yeah. was a, you know, when I was doing stop, we would have to stop a bunch of us would go to Washington Square and listen to these cats freestyle. From there, we go to in Kiru and Brooklyn and listen to that was which was most deaf store, most deaf and Talib Kweli's bookstore in Brooklyn, and then the freestyle would continue there. Yeah. Up in New York at the time, up until like the '90s, built a culture that we not only really identified with but defined, and just like the city watched it get gentrified and realized that this is how sometimes this goes. So it was an incredible amount of education and acumen, and it was a wonderful time to grow up. I bet you're getting you're getting so much learning as well as art. It's like you've got this mixed bag, yeah. and then you got to kind of figure it out. I mean, this idea that the more you knew, the more you can use. You know, so we as artists tried to be as well read as possible. We tried to be as informed as possible. You know what I'm saying? We tried to know what was going on in our city so we could talk about it. Right. You know, so. Education being art, 
not and not just going on currently in the world, in the events, what was happening to people. That was important, right? Because we wanted to talk about it. We wanted to express it. Sure. And unfortunately, there was no more money in that. And because, you know, folks had to survive. Yeah. It all changed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It all changed because there was no money in in being an educated, conscious rapper. And then all them cats pivoted, you know? Right. Becomes the whole they supply and demand thing. Enough. It makes a lot of sense, actually, because you're – you're one of those people that I call like a true creative in that like you're creative in so many facets of yourself as opposed to like being pigeonholed into one thing. And it makes sense being surrounded by so many different things as well to kind of incorporate that into who you became. I was like, I love when you talk about like, uh, cause you said in a few interviews that like, you know, you still feel like that kid from the Bronx and like, I totally identify with that as a kid who you are and the things that you learn that turn you into the person that you become. That you're like, oh, you kind of carry this with you, and it it adds layers to you as a human being. It's it's really cool. Thank you. Um, you know, a lot of it is influenced from my parents. My parents were very artistic and creative people. Oh, cool. Uh, my father is a cinematographer by training. My mother's a polymath. You know, she could do no anything way. that she puts her mind to. You know, musician, jewelry designer, welder you know, writer, you know, she does uh, uh, almost anything that she thinks of. So I watched my parents do all of these multifaceted things. Yeah. And then a lot of my heroes are polymaths, you know, you know, Da Vinci and Gordon Parks. Yeah. And people who I saw whose creativity just transcended the medium. And I always wanted to be one of those guys. So, I, I figured out like the core of what my creativity is. And then the, everything else is just know what affects me emotionally. And I know how the music that I want to play works. Now I have to just learn the keyboard. Now I have to get the muscle, muscle memory together. Sure. The expression of the art is always going to be consistent. What I express it through, that's where you have to learn technique. So I think it, I think about it like that. I don't think about like I want to paint. I have to learn how to be an artistic painter. You know, I'm already an artist, and I know what moves me. Now I know I have to learn the technique in that medium to bring that part of me out. And so it doesn't. It's not an arduous task. You know what I mean? It's just like, oh, okay, I just got to get better at. I'm just, I just don't have the finger muscles yet. <laughs> you know right, what I'm right. It's like lifting weights. You know? Sure. When you lift weights, you want to build a specific physique. And, you know, a lot of times physically, we think about these things in ways that we don't think about mentally and emotionally. You put them in these places where it's just like, oh, I want to get in shape. Let me just change my diet and lift weights and, you know, do 30 minutes of cardio. Those are three totally different things. We have no problem compartmentalizing. That's true. Right? Yeah. Eating, lifting weights, running, right? Those three things really don't ever happen at the same time. <laughs> right. <Okay. laughs> Those are three absolutely different things, but we have no problem doing that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We have no problem going, oh, I could run, lift, eat. Okay, yeah, change my entire physiology. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right, cool. But when it comes to like paint, karate, play guitar, we're just like, oh no, that's overwhelming. Right, you know right. How do those so connect? Overwhelming. <laughs> that makes yeah. sense. So, yeah, it makes sense to me. I'm into it. I'm, I'm, I'm on the same frequency. I'm with you. So, I'm wondering what came first then? Your interest in music, acting, or martial arts? Um, they all kind of happened at the same time. Um, martial arts has been with me since I was very young. Mm -hmm. My father was my first martial arts teacher and he learned karate in Okinawa during the Vietnam war what? and kind of, kind of stayed with it. So when he came back and had kids, like I would just see him do karate all the time and That's I wanted so cool. to do it. And so, yeah, he taught me and then I subsequently went off and did my own thing with G Kundo and the Filipino arts and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, and now, you know, traditional Wing Chun Kung Fu. Yeah. Um, but I started doing martial arts when I was like maybe five, four or five, five years old. Really? And I started playing music at that time. 
Yeah. And I had always been on stage, like being on stage is always a big part of my life. So they all kind of happened at once. And I was able to do all of them, you know, because of like, like school plays and choirs and choruses and stuff like that. And because my, my parents were very much in an in, in artistic community in New York. Mm -hmm. We would always go to plays. We would always go to theater. And I was like, you know, I want to do that. I want to do this. And, you know, starting at 14 is when I was on stage professionally at the, for, for the first time at the Negro Ensemble Company space in Manhattan. And no way. I really loved it. And you know, I was on stage playing playing drums and, and acting. And, and I, I always loved it. And I kept into it. Music was really the thing that I focused on solely first mm -hmm. when I went to Manhattan School of Music like that I was I, I thought music was going to be it sure because it just was so incredibly overwhelming and as a musician I still I still play consider myself I still consider myself a musician so um music was the thing that I thought it was was going to be the rest of my life and then um, at Manhattan School of Music, um, I realized that I needed more. Right. You know, I needed more than just this. And that's when I auditioned for Stomp. And Stomp was perfect because it blended all the things that I love into one show. It was martial arts. It was physical storytelling, you know, like Jackie Chan and Buster Keaton. Yeah. It was it – was it was drumming, which I, I've been doing since I was five years old. So I was just like, this is it. And I learned you found it. everything that I needed to know about all of them during my time. As well. And so that, I mean, that's become, you know, one of the biggest shows there is. It's so, it's such a neat idea yeah. to have a percussion performance on like trash cans and sinks. And it's so cool. It's, I love it. Yeah, it's a great show. It's great fun. 25 years in New York City and Ooh. still going strong. It's just one of those things that was light-changing um, and trans just, just really transformed me into the artist that I am today. Sure. Um, made me lifelong friendships. You know, I met my wife doing the show. She and I were in the same show. Oh, that's cool. And, you know, got me a family. So it's, it's just, it was just a, a life-changing experience on a lot of different levels. Yeah. But it, it made me the artist that I am today, no question. What was that audition like? Because it's, it's percussion, but it's also a Broadway show. Like there's, there's facets where it's not like, here's a bucket, drum on it, and then you're in. Yeah. The storytelling um, aspect of it is really why it's so it's been going on for so long. Mm -hmm. And people don't really see that part because it's such a dynamic show. Right. Because we're also very physical and the found object percussion is so loud. Like that's the first and the biggest of all the impressions. But the reason why it works is because the story and stomp is crafted so very well. So you go on the journey in a way that doesn't um, ever bore you. Everything is this about this discovery. Everything is about this, you know, language that these people on stage speak that no one else speaks. And yeah. as you're in the audience, you're learning, you're learning how to speak this language. Um, so the show is more more about communication than anything else and how we as human beings can communicate with one another without even, you know, saying the words we all have agreed on that have meaning. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why the show has been so popular for so many years, because you can be from anywhere in the world and enjoy the show. It's just a human language. That's true. That's true. How long were you? How long did you do that? Off and on for about ten years. Oh man, how was how was the reunion show? Because that was last year. They that had... was last year. Oh. It was emotional. It was really bad. emotional. Did you remember it? Yeah, there was like, yeah, you know, it's one of those things. It's like riding a bike. As soon as you get started on it again, it's like boom, it all comes back. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm definitely a lot older. <laughs> Is the so, sink heavier? <laughs> so the. <laughs> 
the yeah, the <laughs> body doesn't work as well as uh, it did when I was in my twenties doing the show. Sure, I sure. definitely need a lot of ice yeah. <laughs> after the show. Sure, sure. But I bet. what was great? It was yeah. But it was great just being on the stage with all the people that I love and. Um, I haven't been on stage, sharing the stage with them. It was just wonderful again. And the thing that was great was there were a lot of stop babies. A lot of people oh. in the show got married and had kids. All the stop children were there. And that was just overwhelming to see. It's like your family got bigger and you're meeting the next generation. Yeah, yeah exactly. It was just a wonderful thing to be a part of. Yeah. So what did you play in the show? I was the lead of the show. I started out no as kind of kind of the guy who could do everything. Yeah. So I was like, I was in every number, but I wasn't the lead. And then eventually I ended up leading the show. Nice. And then I led the show for the uh, U.S. tour and then Australia what? and um, parts of uh, parts of the East. Dude. But um, mostly led the show in New York. What did your wife play? My wife was, um, she had one of the lead female roles. Cool. So there are two female roles in the show, which have expanded actually. Now more women play different roles. But at the time, there were only two women per show. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one of the like the kind of the foundation lead women in the show she played. She's also, full yeah. disclosure, super inspiring as well. Man, does does anyone work harder than the she, bests? Yeah. I don't think so. And I feel like I work pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're we're uh, we're definitely not still. No, no, <laughs> definitely, film. definitely we're, we're, not. We're constantly. She moves so much. Like sometimes I'm just like, I only see her at the end of the day, and I'm like, hey, yeah, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen you all day. That's right. I saw your Instagram stories. You look like you had a good day. Yeah, you're killing it. <laughs> killing it. Well done. You, know. <laughs> but, like, yeah. you, you look He's different. Awesome. <laughs> That's... Yeah, where did you come from? Yeah, yeah. is your hair different? <laughs> exactly. And correct me if I'm wrong, it was while working on Stomp when you were scouted for episode one. Yeah, in San Francisco. Um, I was doing a tour and oh, really? Robin... Yeah, Robin Gerlin was in the audience, and she cast uh, Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. Sure. And it was those things that never happens to people. You know, like she saw me in the show, it was just like, we'd like you to audition. And then next thing you know, boom. Dude. I'm in London. Yeah. In CGI. <laughs> what, what was that audition like? Because I imagine she didn't give you drumsticks in a bucket and say, all right, let's do this. She didn't give me drumsticks, nor a bucket, nor a script, nor a picture, not what? an idea of anything. She was just like, I can't tell you anything. I can't <laughs> tell you. I can't show you any pictures. I can't give you any sides. You just have to, like, do these scenarios. Oh. Um, like an improv workshop. I'll, yeah, exactly. It was an improv workshop. Wow. And, you know, she... Put it on tape, showed it to George, and then I'm at Industrial Lights and Magic the next week. It was bananas. Goodness. She just knew, I guess. She really liked what I did physically. Like I said, I've always been physical. It was a very physical, it's not a very physical show, but I was able to bring a personality through my physicality. I wasn't just moving. And that's what she said she liked. It's like she saw this character on stage as I was moving. And I was like, that was always my goal. You know, my goal on, on the stomp stage was always to be able to connect to people, but physically tell a story. Like, that was my whole thing. I want to be able to physically tell a story. And um, she got it and then asked me to audition. And, you know, at first I was just supposed to be the physicality of Jar Jar. And then eventually I auditioned for The Voice and oh, got really? that too. But yeah. I don't, but think, then, I don't think I knew but, that. You know, yeah, I was just supposed to be, you know, I was supposed to be like David Prowse was, and then they were going to get Darth Vader, huh. you know, James Earl Jones. I don't know if they were going to get James Earl Jones to be Jar Jar. Yeah. But <laughs> Can you yeah, imagine? I was like, oh, this is going to be difficult. Like, yeah. You know, James Earl Jones, you're going to have Darth Vader as Jar Jar too. 
Yeah, can you imagine um, what that would be like? It would have definitely been different. Just Mufasa's different. voice with your physicality. Like, I'm getting a lot of mixed signals exactly. here. <laughs> <laughs> right? The Gungan King. Yeah, there we but go. But yeah, we don't know, man. It was it was pretty it was pretty um dope just doing the CGI shit. Yeah, I mean um, you're literally on the precipice of like the future. Like you you helped develop things that are being used now. It's crazy. It's cra- yes. like do you ever stop and think about that sometimes like there are people Constantly. in our lifetime that have been like they've literally changed the world. You know, like Steve Jobs, George Lucas were like, "Oh, these hadn't been done before and now we do things this way because of this." And like you're one of those people. I mean, what? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm hoping that that's reflected in my bank account one of these days. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. I'll make some calls for you. <laughs> yeah, but you know, yeah, it's it was it's just really great and exciting and fun to be a part of that collaborative team. You know, it was it was like cutting edge work. And, you know, we were in this like very small bubble yeah. asking questions and with the ability to answer them. And, you know, my part of the team was what can actually be done physically that the ILM could take and, you know, animate. Sure. So all of these things, they were just like, they didn't have the physical... They had physical ideas, but they didn't know how much they would have to execute. Right? Sure. Because they didn't know how much someone could do or someone couldn't do. So, <laughs> you know, a lot of the questions that I got every day were, can you do that? Is that possible? Can you do that? <laughs> sure. Only one way to find and out. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, sure, I could do that. Totally. You know? Always say And yes. so when I, would, when I would do it, they were like, all right, wow, we don't have to do as much. And so what eventually happened was it is created this, this, you know, script library of code that is, became the foundation and the building blocks to everything that we use today in, yeah. in movies when we're talking like CGI characters, like all of that was built because I could do something yeah. and, you know, I don't take that, I don't take that for granted. I, I always, you know think about that and I respect that and, and I'm honored to be a part of that. You know, unfortunately that work, it took, you know, damn near 20 years for that work to actually kind of be recognized. And true. I'm not the only one, I'm not the only one upset about that. You know what I mean? When I talk yeah. to John Noel and Rob Coleman, Legends. when they see and or hear all of these other filmmakers getting credit for the stuff that we did first they're not happy about it you know what i'm saying i bet they're just like we did that That was our we pioneered that we did that first you know what i mean and as but as much as we shouted from the rooftops it just wasn't common knowledge at the time so but it will be very Um, soon yeah we'll hope so hope so you know i think the most important part of that character was the collaboration uh, that we that we made during the process, right. and we created kind of the 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 template of the protocol uh, for that process, and it has since grown into something you know far larger than I think even George could have imagined. But the building blocks for it were started with us you know yeah at ilm and it was it's it was it's one of those things that i think historically should be constantly talked about and paid attention to i agree actually speaking of people who've changed the world john knoll is another one the dude invented photoshop and that's like the beginning brother i mean what yeah i asked him about that did you what do you say yeah 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 yeah. you had to right (laughs) i was like you and i was like how did you guys like come up with photoshop and you know him and his brother thomas were in their garage and john just got out of film school and it was like wouldn't it be cool if there was this you know thing that you could take photos of and change the photos and change the background and his brother was a programmer and he was like oh you know i think that would be cool and they both started working on it and at the time he said kodak and 
a bunch of big film companies were working on the exact same thing and he had no idea. Oh. And, you know, they made Photoshop and rolled it out. And the thing that I always found interesting about that story was John No was just like, we just put our heads down and like made what we liked. Right. We made what we wanted. And had had they known, he said, had we known that Kodak and other these other big companies were doing the same thing, we would have stopped. Oh. Right, because you're against they were like, Goliath. We, they would think of there's there's no way we could we could compete with Kodak. Yeah. You know, why are we doing this? Let's do something else. But they just didn't know. They were just right. like, you know, <laughs> they, we you know, we're just two kids in a garage in Northern California yeah. trying to figure some shit out. You know what I'm saying? And nobody else is doing what we're doing. Wow. And then they had a product and they rolled it out. I I was like, yo, that's Super, these two kids from nowhere made something that an entire company was trying to make. Yeah, that's amazing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Which I'm just like, it's mad inspirational. Yeah. All you got to do is put your and pay attention to what you're doing, and you might invent Photoshop. I mean, you know what I'm you, saying? man, you know, Jeez. if you're thinking about everybody else who's who might be doing the same thing, you'll never make Photoshop. You're right. There's, it, it's like sometimes cliches are cliches for a reason because there's truth in them. You're like, no, look, just focus on your own work and you might make Photoshop. What a wow. You might make Photoshop. <laughs> you know? Man. A product that's turned into a verb. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. That's true. Uh, and you know the guy who made it. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and he's a real dude. I would not want to be the head of the whoever was on the Kodak side of it. You know what I mean? Imagine like you've got your people. You're like, all right, team, here's what we're doing. You're in the lab for months. And then two people from their garage are like, how about this? And you're like, what if he's got like, there's a guy out there who's got a massive grudge against John Knoll. <laughs> he's like, one day you're going to slip and I'll be there. <laughs> he's probably out of a job because Photoshop is bankrupt. That's, <laughs> Photoshop yeah. is gone. I mean, uh, Kodak. Kodak, yeah. Kodak is bankrupt. Kodak is gone. That's right. There's a guy you know on the saying? street like, wrapped Kodak in film. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> oh my god! Just imagine there's a guy with a shopping cart that's just full of old film canisters, and he's like, "One day, John yeah. Noel. One day, no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah." He's on the streets, just rolling, and he's like, "You're better than me. Yeah, <laughs> you're just better." <laughs> oh my god. I hate you because you're better than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Kodak. Rest in peace, right? Rest in peace. They had some good They stuff. did. They did. They had their time on the on the peak of the mountain. We know the name. Man, they still 35. Yeah. Yeah. This, you know, they, this... they couldn't adapt fast enough. They were too big to fail. That's right. That's right. There was another. I think there was a big boat that was the same sort of thing. It was like unsinkable. And then, well, huh. Mm hmm. You know, yeah, I, I don't live in the annals. Yeah. <laughs> now I've got this idea of Kodak being the Titanic and John Knoll being the iceberg. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Meet iceberg John Knoll. That's right. That's right. <laughs> oh my God. So when you're doing, you're doing the body of Jar Jar and things. How many suits did you rip? Because you're very physical, and those suits are just foam latex. There's no way you didn't not rip something. Um, it was more about the arms. The arms were the thing that was really um, – the arms were the thing that was really that, – that were really fragile. Oh. The suit was just hot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I had like – I had like four or five sets of arms. Nice. That they would uh, switch out every time I got muscular and busted through them. Ah, of course. Hardest part was – the hardest part was Tunisia because – of the sand and the grit and all of that stuff. And it was yeah. so hot Ugh. that I had to like take them off and put them on all the time. So uh, they got kind of damaged there, but you know, I didn't really go through a lot of the arms mm -hmm. and the creature, the creature department was just so great. And, and the art department just so great that they had like glues and nail polish and all this other kind of stuff. Sure, to, they were prepared to keep me sorted. Yeah, they were they were prepped. They were bad prepped. So um, I wasn't. I was very low maintenance. 
surprising. Being it was the creature. hardest part was like, yeah, exactly. The hardest part was like ILM was going through computers, like <laughs> they oh, were just no. frying laptops every every you know hours. Sure. So they'd be throwing out laptops. Oh my god, I never so, thought about that. And you know, I, it was it was just mostly me and ILM, you know. So they were they were way more. Yeah, you know, <laughs> they paid people paid a lot more attention to them than they did to me <laughs> sure i never thought about that laptops in the desert those that does not mix at all yeah the laptops were just frying and they kept the thermometer on their carts oh really just so they knew what the temperature was and it, <laughs> as soon as the temperature hit like laptop death yeah <laughs> they were just like well there it goes smash and they, were just, they quick, tried quick, to quick, keep them as cool as possible but it was like nope Oh my there it goes. God. Done. <laughs> did you ever pass out? I didn't. No, a oh. couple people did, but yeah, there's something about Tunisia. Like I really felt at home there. Really? Okay. I really loved it there. Yeah, yeah. Just something I don't about know. It? There was a there was a familiarity to me about it, and you know, I love the the people were just so wonderful, and I didn't have a hard time getting around because it's a it's a French speaking country and I spoke French. Oh. I spoke French and Arabic. So um I had I spent a lot of time just on the streets. That's kind of cool. feeling the neighborhood and going to the marketplace. And everybody was mad cool with me. Mm-hmm. So I, I was really comfortable there. The heat didn't really bother me too much. Um there were a couple of days that were really, really tough, but I prepped for it, you know, because I knew I was going to be in this foam latex and in, in this really intense place. I started really working out kind of hard and I got my cardio up nice, so I could withstand, it, you know, so I trained for it. Uh, um, everyone else did not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, a lot of, a lot of the crew were passing out in the middle of the desert or they we get back to the hotel and they just heat exhaustion and i just kept drinking water i was just like on the water all day long there you go you're like please um please i got this yeah so i, I was i was prepared i was prepared for it now you might be the only person who can answer this question but i can't have you on my show and not ask it um what's liam neeson like i love him me too but i, I don't know him, him. I mean, he's <laughs> He's, he's um, just a fantastic human being, just a wonderful human being, very uh, open, easy to work with, uh, a fountain of knowledge. That's so cool. Just someone that you can, you can collaborate with who's open to ideas. He was the one who actually got me out of my head during shooting because I would have all of these ideas and not say anything because I didn't want to get fired. Right. And I didn't have this, my first, I didn't have a pedigree of any kind. And, you know, Liam was this, you know, he was pretty much, Oscar uh, Schindler. you know, he was a big name. Yep. Yeah. He was Oscar Schindler. Yep. Worked with everybody. So, you know, one of the first days of Phantom Menace is the, the meeting where I meet. Quite gotten gin for the first time, and we're walking through the forest, and it's just like, you know, the ability to speak does not make you intelligent. Don't get lost. No, I'm sorry, that whole part, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar. <laughs> then there's a part, and then there's a part where I'm just like, oh no, and I jump up and I dive into the ground. Oh yes. Um, well, at first I was just supposed to fall, oh. and then uh, you know we're going through it, and and I and I just like fall a couple of times and you know get out of the way and Liam looks at me and he goes what's going on and I was like I don't think this is like I think this we can make this better I think we can this could be more funny and he was like well what do you want to do and he was like I kind of want to just jump straight up in the air and dive on the ground yeah you know as the thing comes through and he goes all right and he goes come on and we walks over to George and I'm like, oh shit, Liam's <laughs> gonna fucking stick up for me, right? Yeah, he's gonna he's gonna be like, yo, George, this is what we should do. Right? Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, okay, get over to George. And Liam goes, George, Ahmed has an idea. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> he got you good. 
<laughs> and like put me right on the spot. And I was like, oh, shit. well, I got to say it now. Right. And I said, so as you know, I kind of had this idea of like when the, 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 <laughs> the droid comes by shooting at us, I jump straight up and like dive onto the ground. And George was like, can you do that? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, all right, let's see it. And so we go do a take again. I do it. And that's the thing that, you know, George cracks up because, you know, the last thing you see leaving frame is like the feet. Yeah, your you feet. Know? Yeah. And so <laughs> George laughs at it. He's like, oh, this is great. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's the, the take that movie. And then Liam was like, if you have an idea, share it. Yeah. Don't, don't, you know, you never know what you can contribute. Like, have an idea, share it. And I was like, I got it, man. Yeah. You know, from now on, I'm going to approach this thing differently. I'm here, you know? Yeah. Up until that point, I was just like, I'm going to make sure that people don't recognize that they hired the wrong dude. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, I was like, you know what? No, I'm in this thing. And if I'm going to be in it, I got to be me. So, you know, Hell most yeah. of my scenes in fashion is were with Liam. Yeah. So we spent just a... In a, an incredible amount of time together. So he was just, he's just a really special person to me. And I really learned so much from him, you know, just about how to be an actor and how to act in movies and, and just really know who I am and what I can contribute and what I do contribute to the storytelling. So he's just a wonderful human being. I, I just really, I really just love him. That's so cool. I had to ask, you know, that's kind of like, you know how everyone has that like fictional character as a kid. We're like, Goku, like, this is my hero that I'm going to try to emulate my life. That was Qui-Gon Jinn for me. And you've actually met Qui-Gon Jinn, not just Liam Neeson, but like Qui-Gon. I'm like, I can't let that pass by. I mean, technically, he met me first. That's true. That is true. <laughs> Dude, oh, here's something I've always wondered. So obviously, I'm a massive fan of Jar Jar. You know this. Probably the rest of the world know this because I'm excitable. Uh, but... How many takes did you go to before you like settled on the voice? Because I love it and it's so specific. Yeah, that was a George Lucas call. I I really? gave him like six or seven different voices, mm -hmm. and that's the one he chose. Like I put a bunch of voices on a on a tape, and and that's the one he liked. You know, he was just like, "Yeah, do that one." That's the one. I was like, "Okay." That's, That's so the one. Cool. And it's a voice that I used to do for like little kids just to make them laugh. Oh, no way. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. I'm for like my little, my, my cousins and my nieces and nephews. Yeah. You know, every time I play with little kids, I do this voice for the little kids and Dude. they would love it. So that's what I just did for Jar Jar. It worked because I was, I was eight when it came out. And Jar Jar was like one of my mm -hmm. favorite characters because I don't know. It's like you were speaking a language I understood. And then the physicality, you got the whole mm -hmm. like Buster Keaton thing going on. Like, it's almost mm -hmm. like you and George knew what you were doing. It's very interesting. Yeah, it's almost <laughs> as if we made it the way we thought we'd make it. Yeah, it's like these things are deliberate, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Weird. And then you got brought back on for two and three, and that's amazing because yeah. I'm also a massive fan of Rob Coleman, living legend. And you got to work into that. Oh, I know. I know you had a lot of like input into the Yoda fight as well, and I did. Yeah, that was great fun. Let's talk. I, there's anime influences. Fun. I'm a big anime fan. You're a big anime fan. Let's talk. Yeah, it was quite. You know, it was funny because Rob, we read the fight in the script, and I was like, "Oof, I don't know about <laughs> this." <laughs> you know, I mean, and I'm sure George had a vision. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, Rob. I, I, Rob has always been so open and so collaborative and, and you know what a great human being and Rob was walking around and I was like hey man did you read this Yoda fight and he was like yeah I really don't know what to do about it <laughs> and you know he's like I gotta pitch it to Rick but you know he's like we're kind of stuck in animation I'm like how did this fight how does this fight go so I was like yo man come to my dressing room we're gonna watch some movies so I pulled out Ninja Scroll and Samurai Shampoo. My personal favorite. And Akira. Nice. Um, I showed him some scenes and I was like, I'm, I've, you know, and 
you always have to be careful when you're making these kind of suggestions, especially to different departments, because it's not your thing. And right. you do want to help, but you don't want to step on any toes. And I had such great respect for Rob. You know, we were working on this thing together. And um, I was just like, let's just watch these scenes and, you know, see what you think. Right. So we watched these scenes. And he was like, oh, this is great. It's like he got super inspired. And then I kind of was just like, let's write something. Let's like write a scene. Mm -hmm. And I started writing like, you know, and I showed him, I think, a Jet Li movie. I showed him um, Fifth the Legend. Oh, sweet. And I was just like, all right, let's write this scene. Let's see what Yoda can do. And, you know, I said, we have to have Yoda. My, the biggest thing that I influenced rob coleman on which i'm super proud of yeah other than him flying around with a lightsaber was like we have to have yoda hit that stance right like we ha- he has to uh, you know like the bruce lee into the dragon come on let's yeah. go stance. I was like yoda has to hit stance. so after he throws the rocks and everything and dooku right before they pick up the lightsabers yoda hits that stance and i was like yes yep. if anything <laughs> If I could take credit for anything in this whole sequence, I'm taking credit for that. I'm like, that's what it that's what needs to happen, right? And when Yoda hits the stance, it's just like, oh shit, Yoda's yeah. about to go down. And it kind of made him it, it, it made him a badass. And what I said to Rob was like, this is the first time we see Yoda do anything. True. It has to be. Um, it has to be like mind blowing, and I was like, and I and I think you set it up like this. Rob just took my suggestions and was so generous, you know, and because he didn't have to listen to me, he didn't have to take my suggestions or anything like that. It didn't have True. to happen, but he did. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. he took this little like script that I I kind of hobbled together. He took it to animation, and they made this fight. And when I saw it, I was just like, yo, that's. That's what we did. That's what we talked about. That's what we worked on. Yeah. And I was just, I was just so um, overwhelmed by it, and and I loved it. And it was the best scene in the movie. I agree. It, it was it, the best scene. It's interesting looking back now that you had such a direct hand in my opinion, one of the greatest moments in all of Star Wars ever. Like I remember when those commercials yeah, was, came out, I kept rewatching it because you're like, "What? Yoda's got a lightsaber and he doesn't grab it. He uses a force to pull it into his hand." You're like, "Oh, waited my whole life for this." That was the idea. Yeah, the idea was Yoda's force is that strong. Yeah, that he doesn't need to grab the lightsaber. Oh, it's so you know, cool. Dude. One of my original ideas was just like Yoda's force was so strong that he didn't even need a lightsaber. He was going <laughs> to fight Dooku without. Oh man! But no, they wanted Yoda to have a lightsaber, and I was just like, "Yeah, I mean, of course." You That's never fair. see him wield a lightsaber before, so I'm like, "Yeah, of course." But they did do like the force catch when he pulled it. Yeah, and I was like, "Yeah, that's it. That's the vibe." Like Yoda's, Yoda's there it is. that connect force. He's that diesel. Yeah, you know? but yeah, loved it. Like my my biggest. My biggest contribution was hit him hitting the, the kung fu like stance. I was like, "You got to do it." It's so cool. Yeah. It's so cool. <laughs> yeah, he, but you know, that's a shout out to Rob Coleman, man. I really have to say, like, Rob honestly didn't have to come to my dressing room. We didn't have to watch those movies. He didn't have to do any of that shit. That's he had true. a whole team of people. He's the head of animation. He didn't have to do none of it. And the cat is just so open, so generous, such a wonderful human being that he was just like, let's see what you have to say, you know? And that was in, in, incredibly important to me. That's so cool. That's also like, you know, you mentioned before, like collaboration, because if you hadn't brought that up, there's a very high possibility we wouldn't have gotten that. You know, it's like, you never know. Mm-hmm. You never Absolutely. know. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been dope still, but I'm glad that, I I had a, a hand in the dopeness. Yeah, you raised it up. It's like, sure, it still could have been cool, but it might not have been as cool. I'll give you the credit. I'm gonna I'm yeah. gonna just throw this on you. Take it. And then sure, you then sure. you came back for the third one. Amazing. Rounded out the prequels. Yeah, yeah. So cool. came back for Sith, and yeah. then you know that was it for me. I so I have this. Yeah. I had this idea 
uh, uh, a ton of years ago that I want to run by you. So I was thinking, mm-hmm. right? Because there's the Darth Jar Jar theory, right? Which is pretty cool. But I got another one that's more like heady and just really sad. So here we go. Are you ready? Okay. Are you sitting down? I am. Okay, cool. Just making sure. Do you have tissues nearby for when you start crying? Yeah. Cool. All right, here we go. So yes. imagine this, right? In a world, it's between episode three and four, obviously, right? Imagine if Jar Jar is hailed as like an imperial hero, right? Like a guy who saw into the future and was so forward thinking that he was the one person brave enough to vote emergency powers to the chancellor to create this galactic empire. That's interesting. Right? That's interesting. And then Jar Jar has to battle with the fact that everyone who is pro-empire is treating him like this hero, but he knows that it led to the extinction of the Jedi and his friends. Yeah. Yeah. So there's like a statue of Jar Jar. I like that. Think about it. Yeah. You know? I like that idea. Yeah, it gets all cerebral. I like that idea. And then maybe Jar Jar becomes a a rebellion hero. Who knows? Who knows? I think that's very smart. Oh, stop it. I think that's a very smart idea. I'll call some people, like you it. call some people, like we'll see what happens. We'll make people sad. Yeah, we'll make that happen. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> what? what's your, do you have a favorite anime? Um, favorite anime. That's difficult. That's a difficult question. I yeah. have a lot of favorites. Top three. But I'm going to have to say the thing that really, the, the thing that got me into anime was Akira. So, that's probably going to be my, my that's number a good one. one. When Akira came out, when it first came out, I was just like, oh, I'm in. But you yeah. know, that's kind of that's that's partially untrue. Oh, I used cool. to watch um, back in the seventies. There was this show called Battle of the Planets, but in Japan it was called Gotcha Man. Oh, it was a television show, and it was about these bionic um, teenagers who would like dresses. They would be their their bionics were based on birds. Oh, wow! Um, and the Japanese made a, a live action movie of it, like about, I think about 10 years ago. But um, on TV, it was called Battle of the Planets. But um, in Japan, it was called Gotcha Man. And I was really into Gotcha Man as a kid. So it was like Gotcha Man, Speed Racer. Ooh. They all came out at the same time, like those, those kind of anime uh, cartoons and shows. Yeah. So I've probably been into anime for damn near. 40 years yeah but um the thing that solidified like uh feature anime was probably akira so i'd probably say gotcha man uh mm, this is tough i know i know gotcha man voltron Ooh, good one good one gotcha man voltron mighty orbots Oh. This is not in order. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Gotcha Man, Voltron, Mighty Orbots, Akira. Gotcha Man, Voltron, Mighty Orbots, Akira. And then um, uh, what I'm really loving now is One Punch Man. Dude, same. Have you seen the second season yet? I have. I wasn't oh. very um, I was a huge fan of the second season. Yeah. First season, I love First season's perfect. But... <laughs> Yeah, first season is fantastic. Second season, I was like, eh. Yep. I want to see the third season, and I want to see uh, Attack on Titan third season. Too. Yeah. yeah, you know, I haven't started Attack on Titan yet. I've heard it's amazing. It's good. It's a little creepy, but yeah. I like it. I mean, people are getting eaten. I'm a samurai shampoo man. That's my. It's my all time. Huge. Huge yep. in the samurai shampoo. Yep. It's my. It's my favorite. Huge I, just, I just had my wife watch it for the first time. And I was like, let's check this out, because she didn't grow up on anime. And I was like, just give it a shot. And she loves it. And I was like, yes, I married the right one. It's so good. It's so good. Yes. The samurai who smells like sunflowers. Yes, exactly. Mugen Jin, so cool. So I yeah. know you went on later on. You did some voice work as well. I know you did, uh, um, uh, what was the Marvel game? Uh, Ultimate Alliance 2. Pretty cool. I did, yeah. Pretty cool. You got to be a superhero. Yeah, I got to be a couple. It's funny, I do all of these things and then I forget. That's why I'm here, Ahmed. <laughs> I forget. And then I get a text like, hey, you were in Marvel Ultimate Alliance? And I was like, oh, yeah, I did do that, didn't I? <laughs> That's right. It's like, I was listening, to, I was playing Not this cloak that. and I heard you. What's up? Yeah, yeah, I was cloak. Yeah. Dude. And like, you were cloak? I was yeah. like, oh, yeah, that's right. I was cloak. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that one. Yeah. <laughs> 
I know you did that. I know uh-huh. I know you made me well, you didn't make me, but because of you, I watched an episode of Cougar Town. Um Yeah. Dude. That, <laughs> that every time I see a spin class, I think of that scene. So well done. It stuck with me. Yeah. It's golden. Yeah. Courtney Cox. She was great. I yes. Loved her. She was awesome. I just love any every single uh spin class. I just think, try harder, Carol. And I was like, Yep. I just your performances stick with people, Ahmed. <laughs> Thank you. It's not that, bad. If, if anything, as an artist, that's what I want to do. And then I have to, I have to commend you. Um, one of my favorite things that you've done that I watched, kid you not, years ago. I don't know how I found it, but I did. Um, when is the next episode of The Nebula coming out? The Nebula. You know, I've been trying to resurrect that show for 14 years. <laughs> How do I uh, help? The funny thing is, we <laughs> had just an enormous amount of money. Yeah. Okay. I'm the Nebula it. was very. It was a. It was a lot of fun. It was very difficult to do because you need a spaceship. Right. And I found a spaceship. Um. That eventually, like after I did the Nebula, everybody started using my spaceship. So now I can't <laughs> even get in there. Oh no. To get the spaceship. <laughs> um, but I'm hoping that an iteration of the Nebula will come out in the next couple of years. Oh, that's the um, best news I gotta ever. The, I got to get the crew back together. But it's a it's a project that always comes back to me, and I always like people are always just like, let's repitch the Nebula. So I'm always pitching the Nebula, and everybody's like, great, let's do it, and then it falls through. Right. And I was up on sci-fi comedy before sci-fi comedy was a thing. You were. And now, you know, you have the Bill and you have Avenue 5 and like now all of this sci-fi comedy is coming out. So I'm hoping the landscape is cool enough now that the Nebula can have a life. I hope so. But we'll see. It's so good. Like the dude's eyebrows. It's so funny. Yeah. I love it. I love it so much. Yeah, that's He's an amazing comedic actor and he plays Lieutenant Commander Sorek. Yes. It's so good. <laughs> Martin Luther Captain. Amazing. Martin Luther Captain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, well, good. I'm glad it's, it's a very it's, fun show. I love I'm glad it's still in the ether and still being talked about because it needs to be. It's so good. So Thank you very much. A, a, another thing that I was l- very lucky enough to be in person for, uh, Celebration Chicago last year. Mm-hmm. Um. You came out onto the onto the stage, and there's an entire stadium of people chanting your name. I'm not going to say I started it, but I mean, you know, if you want to put some credit <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> what? What? I firmly believe you began it. Yeah, I mean, there was a there was a guy who stood on a chair and then realized it's a folding chair and you shouldn't do that and almost fell. That was me. Um, but what what was that experience like after everything? going into the a stadium in Chicago like what's going through your head um you know i was i, I was kind of nervous to be honest i bet um it was uh i hadn't been to a celebration since 99 and um i was actively staying away from them you know cuz i just didn't want to deal with whatever might have come so uh, you know there was a lot of trepidation. I was like, did I make the right decision? Did I not? Should I have stayed away? Is it my, am I starting in, you know, I don't know what, what's happening. It's what's going to happen. But I've never been one to, you know, not face my fears. Right. Um, so it, it was really for me just kind of like about that. It was about you know, stepping out there and facing it and see what was going to happen because I had no idea what was going to happen. And, you know, I also like the fact that there's a whole new set of, Star Wars people that everybody wants to go see. So I was like, well, a lot of attention probably won't be on me as much. Right. <laughs> Everybody's going to want to see like Daisy Riddle and John Boyega and shit and Oscar, you know? Right. So I was just like, all right, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And it was, it was what a pleasant surprise. Well, good. Um, and it, it was, it was just really great and really nice and really good to be in front of those people and, sit next to people that I've I've known for quite a while and and really admire, you know, Ian McDermott and and um Anthony Daniels, Warwick, you know, Ray Park. You know, right. I don't see those people very often. Uh and when I do, it's just kind of like a, a weird family reunion. So I I really just quite like being 
on that couch and being around those people and seeing the fans really enjoy us and enjoy our conversation. You know, the prequels don't get as much love as um, others do. Agreed. And I'm glad now people are like starting to appreciate them for what they were. I agree. And I'm glad you're finally getting what I believe to be your due. It took forever, but I'm glad you're getting it now. And before I let you go, you've got a one-man show that you're working on. How's, yeah. that, how's that going? How excited are you? When are you thinking it's going to happen? Why a one-man show? What you got? Um, I'm very excited for it. I'm trying to get it on stage sometime later this year. It's being um, worked on as we speak. Uh, it's terrifying. I bet. I've never done a one-man show before. I've always wanted to do a one-man show since I was a kid, and I saw Whoopi Goldberg doing her thing. Yeah. Um, so it's always been something that I, I had on the list that I never really had an idea of what to do, and then this show came to me, and I wrote it. And so um, now it really is about finding the right time and the right place to put it up because I, I have everything that I need to actually physically make the thing in place. So hopefully at a theater somewhere soon. <laughs> Amazing. I can't wait. And uh, one last thing, uh, where can people find you online? You can find me on Instagram at Best Ahmed. You can find me on Twitter at I'm at best. You can find me on Pinterest. Love it. Which is where I spend a lot of my time. I spend a lot of time on Pinterest. Wow. Because like I'm it. at best. Uh, I like Pinterest quite a lot. Wow. And um, you can find uh, me doing my podcast. Yeah. The Afrofuturist. It's the so Afrofuturist good. podcast at theafrofuturist.com. Yeah. And on iTunes. For Futurist Podcast. Love it. Love it. Ahmed, again, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate the years of inspiration. Everything you do, you're fantastic. Everybody, keep a lookout for his one-man show coming out later this year. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. That's balance with two L's. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows about a bunch of random things, you can now do that at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, Victor, JC, and Christina. Your support means so much to me, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.